How did you get into the Mar uh, Marilyn Monroe project? I mean, that, that just, just strikes me as the memoir of Marilyn Monroe means Marilyn Monroe's got to got to write it, and we all sort of have this pop culture identification with Marilyn Monroe and her little career highlights and everything. We know she had a lot of trouble romantically and uh, with drug abuse and whatnot, but we tend to over, the culture tends to overlook that a lot, and you seem to plunge into that. Can you talk about how you got into the Marilyn Monroe project? And, and I noticed that it, it's the memoir of Marilyn Monroe and that it's edited by you, so that, that's kind of an interesting right. take on what you've been talking about. Uh, and do some reading if you, if you like. Uh, okay, the memoir we'll of talk Mar about that. The memoir of Marilyn Monroe. Um, it takes the position that she uh, did not die in, um, in 1962. Uh, that she actually uh, survived, was uh, rescued from that situation, and she's now 85 years old and facing a terrible. Um, operation because she's been in an accident and so she sits down to write her story and the memoir is her story of what's gone on for the past 85 minus 36 years and um, the, what drew me to it is I, I don't I was not a Marilyn watcher I didn't care about Marilyn Monroe I think I saw two movies bus stop at the misfits um, but I listened on my in my car to Donald Spoto's um, biography of Marilyn Monroe, and I was I just I was fixated on her um, fears, her abandonment fears, her uh, frailties. I just totally related to her as a woman. Mm. I didn't care about the. Um, the star part of her, I wasn't interested in it. And as I, and I, I, I would have to say, it almost came in a like flash that she was going to be at that time. It was probably like a few years before her 80th birthday. Uh -huh. And I decided I would write this book that would be based on her. 80th birthday and it, so much time went by that it became her 80, 85th birthday but I just flashed on what would happen if she didn't die you know A and big way um, of. and um, the um, and that's how it happened and I read a lot I read a lot about Marilyn Monroe and I have weaved into the book um, a lot of truth and a lot of speculative truth, especially concerning the conspiracy about the Kennedys and um, and other things. Um, I'll read a little bit of it. Yeah, do that, please. Thank that would you. be great. This is the very beginning of the book. And it is titled Drama Queen. June 1st, 2011. They say only the good die young, and I guess it's true because I'm still here. Today is my 85th birthday. During these years, I have lived three lives, before Marilyn, being Marilyn, and after. I created Marilyn Monroe, and then men molded her, studios, agents, and husbands. Ever since the night I did not die, I have tried to leave her behind, but wherever I went, the creature, the creature followed. I tried to run. I tried changing my name, my country of residence, my hair color, body type, career, and sexual preference. I went to college for coursework in humanities and studied Russian literature. But there was no escaping her. The character I created became my own personal monster and devoured me in the 50s. And even after she died, I could no more be someone else then I could change my skin color or stop being a movie star. I'm skipping those sort of spicy parts. Okay. My so-called death scene is always described the same. My housekeeper, Eunice Murray, finds me wasted, naked body, tang naked body tangled in a sheet. Um, I am face down with one hand hanging over the telephone. This detail is discussed often. Am I answering a call or making one? And if I am calling, then whom? But it did not happen that way. I cheated death. Eunice Murray administered an enema of chloral hydrate on the orders of my psychiatrist, Ralph Greenson. My psychiatrist wanted me dead because he could no longer contain me. Eunice Murray wanted me dead because I had fired her, and this was her last day on the job. But they didn't succeed. 
and the reported sightings of Marilyn Monroe still walking the earth are absolutely true, because here's what happened. On the night of August 4th, 1962, young Joey DiMaggio III, that is the Yankee Clippers' son, on leave from Camp Pendleton, where he served in the Marines, arrived on the doorstep of Palm Drive, my home in Brentwood, at 8 p.m. No sound announced his arrival. Nothing in my world stirred. He was tall like his father, but with a fuller face, so his nose was not quite so prominent. Probably the lamp over the doorbell cast a diligent spotlight over his jaw, creating a moody study <clears throat> in excuse me, light and shadow. The kind of shot you might see in a noir film from the 40s. Joey was kinder than his father. He had a heart bigger than the new Yankee Stadium, and he used to fill it with people, not always the kindest kind. DiMaggio, the father, might have been the last American knight, but it was his son who saved my life. He had broken his engagement and wanted to, to talk. Joey and I were very close from the time he was 10 when Clipper, at Joe and I started courting the first time. Joey had a key to every play, place I ever lived, but I imagine before he let us, himself in that he stood for a few minutes at the doorway where the bougainvillea had lately blossomed in time for my birthday. Always around my birthday, everywhere I make sure there is the sweet scent of hibiscus, bougainvillea, lilies, and lilacs. I was a spring baby. No one could ever take that away from me. I suspect Joey debated whether or not to come in. The DiMaggios are a formal group even today, a classic Italian family, and good manners are inbred. But Joey was 20 years old and brokenhearted, so he turned to me for comfort while I was dying in the bedroom from an overdose. I was swimming around in a morbid, horrible darkness. What I remember is his khaki hat as he bent over me and laid his young man's mouth over mine. What are you doing? I was struggling to say. It was a bad dream. It had to be. Because here was my sweet Joey trying to kiss me, just like all of the men in Hollywood who had bought me, then brought me down. Zanuck, Wilder, Charlie Feldman, Arthur Miller, and now Joey? No, please God, no. It must be that I was going start raving mad, just like my mother. And so she is saved, and she is uh, detoxed, and she is... Um, taken to a house where she's detoxed and I'll just tell a little bit more. I, I don't really know how much time I should read, but I'll just read a little bit more. Sure, go ahead. I, I was out of hope. I did not want to die, but I wasn't all that anxious to go on living, if you could call this living. I was tired of drugs and men and being in the public eye. In fact, I was flat out exhausted. If I never did anything or saw anyone for the rest of my life, that would be fine. I especially didn't want to see or hear from anyone I knew, and at the top of that list were my agent, my lawyer, and the studio. This was what I was pondering when two women showed up. One of the women was tall and butch-looking in her 40s. It's ironic that I thought that because I learned later that her last name was Man. She knocked on the bedroom door, and without waiting for me to invite her, she came in, just sort of assumed, if you know what I mean. She basically pulled another woman along with her. The other woman was younger, smaller. She was intimidated by me, so I smiled at her automatically, turning on my Marilyn face to put her at ease. I'm Marguerite. This is Sue, said the older one. I'm Marilyn. At this, the younger one kind of broke up, laughing, and we all got the joke. I mean, I was not wearing any makeup at all, just wranglers and a sweater. But to Sue, I think I seem still a movie star. I asked if they needed money for a donation for something. No, Marguerite said. Her eyes were dark, fathomless, and profound, wounded. I've flown all the way from New York to see if we can help you stop killing yourself with drugs. And so... Marilyn gets sober, and she goes on, and then I'm just going to read this part, which is the present. St. Albans Memorial Ho Hospital, Portland, Oregon, 2011. The nurse who takes care of me in this hospital is Cherie. An odd coincidence, as will become clear. Each of the 10 days I have been here, my wounds are checked and cleaned. Cherie is the only nurse allowed to see beneath the bandages. Cherie is Romanian. As she, as she works, she will tell stories of her time as a sex slave and how she escaped from a trafficker who had purchased her when she was 12. The stories stab me with her pain, but they also put my own trouble in perspective. Good morning, Cherie. I tried to smile, but my, man, my bandages won't let me. You have the big tub. 
It is Wednesday, she replies. I remember that last week, on Wednesday, I guess, she had immersed me in a sort of portable spa with a salty taste. The body submerged beneath the bath water is foreign to me. I am wrinkled. My outsized breasts droop. My coloring is very fair, and my pubic area is hairless like any other old woman. I am less gorgeous than Georgette O'Keeffe. I still think of sex, and finally, it is with a soft lens, dreamy and pretty. That's as much as I'll read. I mean, because it goes on and on. She goes to Cuba, and she goes. She has a young lover, and then she she works in a uh, shelter for dogs, and she's poor, and then she's rich again, and um, she finally does have to have a face transplant because she was. Uh, burnt up in a fire out of revenge in the present tense and um, her face is fixed and she uh, at the very end of the book she says I am either going to look like this beautiful young man whose face they transplanted onto hers plus me or I'm going to die from whatever old people die of in hospitals or I will hate the way I look and then I guess I'll just live with it I wanted to kill myself for so long, and then I died and got over it. I wanted the creature killed, and it took some doing, but she left as I lived from the inside out. I, um, Jules, who was her husband, would have loved to see this metamorphosis. He was a pragmatist, and the science of a face transplant would have been much more interesting than whether I looked like Frankenstein or Marilyn. Um, or Sherry Stoppert, or Marilyn Monroe. The name change started in Ben Lyon's office at 20th Century Fox in 1946, when he decided I should pick the name Mary Lynn, and it's been changing ever since. No one alive would call me Marilyn Monroe anymore, but she still exists. Look at all the people who still love her. Wow, so you actually had to become Marilyn Monroe in there, didn't Absolutely, you? Yeah. I felt like Marilyn Monroe. Yeah, did, how long did it take you to get into that feeling? I mean, did you pick that up from the beginning and, and it came right straight through? I, um, I have to think about that. You know, I don't think you it, ever yeah. get into a character immediately, but she and I had a lot in common, and so I could hook into that immediately. So you drew on a lot of your own. Right psychology and right, personal experience. Right, and then I, I, historically, there was so much available that I could um, weave into this character. Yeah, and, I was, yeah. I was, we only, we're, we're going to wrap up, but I was, that's oh one of the God. things that caught me about, about what you would have to do is to take all that in and then filter it out and then try to weave this story. Very interesting stuff. Um, Sandy Gellis Cole has been reading to us from her um, book called The Memoir of Marilyn Monroe. And as an expert, uh, basically career-long editor, she edited her own memoir. But you are Marilyn Monroe. Uh, tell us quickly where we can get the book. Uh, you can get the book on Amazon.com Amazon is the easiest way to get it, The Memoir of Marilyn Monroe. Okay, Sandy, thanks for being with thank us. Thank you very much. Thank you for being with us.